Project sheds new light on an unusual group of elements called the noble gases. First, we'll discover the common features of a useful group of elements in Exploring the Noble Gases. Then, explore a gas that makes space travel possible in Helium, Rocket Science. Next, we'll see what makes Las Vegas so fascinating in Neon, Fabulous Fluorescence. Then, we'll see the world around us in a completely new way in Krypton, faster than a speeding bullet. And finally, we'll put these elements in perspective in Understanding Our Universe. Elements that let us see farther, brighter, and faster. Coming up next. As you watch the first half of this program, keep these questions in mind. What properties do the noble gases share? How do neon and other noble gases produce light? The noble gases do not easily form compounds, and they were not discovered on Earth until after the periodic table was developed in 1869. Chemist William Ramsey found helium and argon in 1894, so he deduced these elements would make up another group on the periodic table. Based on the table, he also determined that at least three elements remain to be discovered. By 1900, scientists had identified and described all the noble gases. What do you know about the periodic table? So, periodic table is an organization of the elements. It goes from left to right and uh, top to bottom in terms of uh, lowest, number amount, lowest amount of protons to highest amount of protons. So, it organizes by valence electrons. I know that like potassium and the metals in the first column start with one valence electron all the way to the noble gases that have a full valence shell. I know like all the groups like the halogen family and the noble gases. It was originally set up by a Russian chemist by the name of Dmitry Men. Medelev. And there's a bunch of um, special gases in the middle that are like weird and all the... Um, I don't know anything about chem, I'm sorry. The noble gases are the most stable group of elements. They are all colorless and odorless. With a few exceptions, they are inert, meaning they do not readily react with other elements. Helium is the second most abundant element in the universe, but it is rare on Earth. Because it is so light, it easily escapes the atmosphere. Most Earth-bound helium is in natural gas deposits deep underground. Neon is best known for the colorful lights of Broadway and Las Vegas. Not known to form any compounds, neon is completely inert. Argon is the third most abundant gas in the Earth's atmosphere. It is often employed to create inert environments for industrial processes and light bulbs. Krypton is occasionally combined with argon to create unreactive atmospheres for industrial processes. It is also used for lighting in high-speed photography. In 1962, Scientists were able to form a compound between xenon and fluorine, making xenon the first noble gas to react with another element, and proving that even the noble gases can form compounds under the right conditions. It is most commonly used in high-powered and strobe lights. Radon is the only radioactive noble gas it was first observed as a decay product of radium. It may present a health hazard if it is found inside a house. 
to understand why it is so difficult for the noble gases to form compounds, let's take a closer look at the periodic table. The elements are listed in the order of their atomic number, which represents the number of protons in an element's nucleus. In its ground or normal state, the nucleus is surrounded by a number of electrons equal to the number of protons. As the atomic number increases, generally so does the size and mass of the atoms. Reading from top to bottom, each horizontal line on the table is called a period. Each period represents the number of electron shells normally occupied by an element's atoms. For example, a krypton atom has four electron shells, so krypton lies in period four. Meanwhile, a radon atom, in period six, has six electron shells. Reading across the table from left to right, the vertical lines of elements are called groups. Elements in a group have the same number of electrons in their outermost electron shells. These are called valence electrons, and they dictate how elements interact. Elements in the same group generally interact with other elements in similar ways. None of the elements greater than atomic number 83 are completely stable. All of them, including radon, are radioactive. All the noble gases reside in group 18 because each one has a full valence shell. A helium full shell has two electrons. All the other noble gases have eight electrons in their outermost shell. Because the noble gases need no electrons to be stable, they rarely react with other elements. Only the heavier noble gases form compounds, and then only in special laboratory conditions. Krypton, xenon, and radon will react because as you move down the group, an atom's hold on its valence electrons becomes weaker. The stability of the noble gases is actually a useful property. These gases are used in many situations where an unreactive gas is needed to maintain a safe and constant environment. Industrial processes such as welding rely on atmospheres of noble gases to prevent explosions, and vintners use argon to prevent wine from turning to vinegar. All of the noble gases will conduct electricity. Neon may be the most familiar gas used for lighting, but argon, krypton, and xenon also fluoresce, and combined, they create many different colors. Did you know fluorine, the most reactive element, made the first compound with the noble gases? In 1962, Scientists produce xenon difluoride. Fluorine currently is known to react with radon, xenon, krypton, and argon. And scientists are trying to produce compounds with helium and neon. Space is truly the final frontier. Engineers exploit specific properties of different elements to come up with solutions to the unique problems posed by space travel so that the human race can continue to explore the unknown. What can we learn from exploring new places? When you go to new places, if there are other people there, you can learn about cultures. By exploring like outer space, we can find out a lot about the other planets and atmospheres. In deep ocean, we can learn a lot about the origins of life. New, new ways of looking at things and uh, just new, new ideas. We get a lot of fashion ideas, like art ideas from there. You could find different resources. You can find new uh, species of different plants and animals. We can learn about religions and social aspects and ways of life. Element number two on the periodic table is helium. The atomic symbol for helium is HE. Helium is a very light, inactive gas that is odorless, colorless, tasteless, and non-flammable. Helium gets its name from the Greek word helios, which means sun, because helium was observed on the sun before it was found on Earth. Helium is classified as a noble gas. It lies in the periodic table's first row, period one. 
Each atom of helium consists of two electrons that surround a compact nucleus, which contains almost all the atom's mass. In the most common form of helium, its nucleus has two positively charged protons, plus two uncharged neutrons. Two negatively charged electrons balance helium's two protons. These electrons are found in a single orbital shell surrounding the nucleus, the sphere-shaped 1s shell. An s shell can only hold two electrons, so helium's electrons fill the shell. This completely filled electron shell makes helium, and the other noble gases, extremely unreactive with other elements. In this experiment, a red balloon is filled with pure helium gas. Helium is very light, about seven times less dense than ordinary air. Released at the same time as a blue balloon filled with argon, the helium balloon rises quickly into the sky because it is so much lighter than the surrounding air. Meanwhile, because argon is about 35% denser than air, the blue balloon falls to the ground. Helium is most widely used in party balloons, scientific balloons, and blimps. Combined with oxygen, it is used by deep sea divers in scuba tanks. Helium may also one day find wide use in superconducting electrical systems and nuclear power plants. Space is often considered the final frontier for exploration. Since 1961, NASA has made many efforts to extend the United States' exploration into space. A reusable vehicle designed for regular missions, the space shuttle traveled into space multiple times. The shuttle could not have been realized without the element helium. To escape Earth's gravity and enter orbit, several engines and rockets work together to accelerate the shuttle to a speed of almost seven miles per second. The shuttle has a main engine at the back of the fuselage, which is fueled by a large external tank containing liquid oxygen and hydrogen. Two solid rocket boosters, or SRBs, are on the sides of the external tank. Its main engine and the rockets power the liftoff. After about two minutes, the rocket boosters separate from the shuttle and fuel tank and fall into the ocean. Once recovered, NASA will use them again. About nine minutes after launch, the external tank disengages from the shuttle. Unlike the rockets, the tank burns up as it descends through the atmosphere. About a minute later, the Orbital Maneuvering System, or OMS, fires to place the shuttle into orbit. This system requires helium to operate. Without it, gravity would pull the shuttle to Earth. The OMS requires some creative engineering to operate in the vacuum of space. First, NASA had to come up with a way to create combustion in the absence of oxygen. The solution is to mix fuel with an oxidizer, a compound that has the same effect as elemental oxygen but is easier to contain. The liquid fuel and oxidizer are kept in separate tanks. When they combine, they produce a volatile gas that powers the shuttle. Another feat of engineering is the pump. A pump needs to move the fuel and oxidizer out of their tanks and into the engine. But a mechanical pump is likely to break down or require adjustments in space. So NASA engineers developed a helium pressure pump for the OMS. Helium kept at high pressure in a single tank is attached to the fuel and oxidizer tanks. 
To ignite the OMS, helium gas is released through a series of valves and tubes. It forces the other liquids from their tanks into the engine, where they combine and ignite. Helium is ideally suited to its role in the shuttle. Because it has a full valence shell, it is completely inert, so there is no danger of it reacting with the fuel or the oxidizer. This prevents any loss of usable fuel, as well as minor damaging explosions. Any non-reactive gas might serve the same purpose, but helium is the best choice because it is so light. Every extra pound of weight the shuttle carries requires more energy to get into orbit. As one of the lightest substances known, helium powers the OMS with the least amount of weight. At the end of a successful mission, the shuttle astronauts fire the OMS one last time to return to Earth. Once inside Earth's gravitational field, the shuttle essentially falls to the ground. Thanks to helium, the astronauts could enter space and return home safely. Did you know? Having successfully reached the moon, NASA is aiming for Mars next. The space shuttle was developed with this goal. It was conceived as a reusable vehicle that would transport people between Earth and a permanent space station in orbit before a separate spacecraft would launch from the space station to Mars. Ever since Thomas Edison introduced the light bulb in 1879, we have relied on electricity to see in the dark. The invention of the neon light in 1910 broadened the possibilities of electricity from the practical to the artistic. And hotspots such as Broadway and Las Vegas have never looked brighter. Where do you see neon lights? When I think of neon lights, I think of like casinos, Atlantic City, like Las Vegas. When you're driving at night, obviously like signs like open. Definitely New York City. Pink Floyd laser show and the roller rink. Element number 10 on the periodic table is neon. The atomic symbol for neon is NE. An odorless and colorless gas, neon gives off an intense red light under high voltage. Neon is named from the Greek neos, meaning new. Neon is classified as a noble gas. It lies in the periodic table's second row, period two. Each atom of neon consists of a cloud of electrons surrounding a compact nucleus that contains almost all the atom's mass. In the most common form of neon, its nucleus has 10 positively charged protons plus 10 uncharged neutrons. Neon has 10 negatively charged electrons to balance its 10 protons. These electrons are found in two orbital shells surrounding the nucleus which can be visualized as being built up from the nearest preceding noble gas, helium. Helium has two electrons distributed in one orbital shell. Neon has eight more electrons than helium. The first two electrons are found in the sphere-shaped 2s orbital shell. The final six electrons fill the three lobe-shaped 2p orbitals. As the 2s and 2p orbitals are all filled, neon's second level valence shell is complete. This makes neon and the other noble gases very stable and extremely unreactive with other elements. Neon gas is contained within this discharge tube. The pressure of the contained neon is low enough and the voltage across these two electrodes is high enough for the neon to conduct electricity. Notice how it emits a characteristic orange-red glow due to excitation of the electrons when placed in the path of the electricity. Neon is the fourth most abundant element in the universe, but only a very small fraction of neon is found in the Earth's atmosphere. Neon is best known as the source of the reddish-orange glow in neon lights, but has also been used to make voltage detectors and TV tubes.
Ever since Thomas Edison invented the incandescent light bulb, our world has been an electrical one. Scientists were fascinated by how naturally occurring elements produced light. They began to experiment with other gases. In 1910, French scientist Georges Claude sent an electrical current through neon gas to produce the first neon lamp, and the neon sign was born. White light was practical, but colored lights were daring and glamorous. They did more than light the way, they mesmerized with their glow. The first neon sign in America was displayed in Los Angeles, California. People were so fascinated by it, they literally stopped traffic to see it. Today, we see neon all around us in those brightly glowing signs that make everyday words like pizza and burgers shine. Nowhere do they shine more brightly than in Las Vegas. Neon transforms this ordinary desert into one of the brightest spots on the planet. Well, people are like insects. They just love light and they're drawn to it and they want to they want to see what it's all about. And so the casino operators and everybody here put a lot of light out and it just draws people in. It just says, we're having a party here, come on in. It takes a unique blend of science and art to bring Las Vegas to life, and the properties of neon make it possible. Neon is an inert gas, which in its natural ground state is odorless and colorless. However, when an electric current runs through a tube filled with the gas, that all changes. The energy supplied by the electrical current is absorbed by some of the electrons in neon's outer shell, and they temporarily jump to a higher energy level. After a brief period of time, the excited electrons fall back to their original location. The energy they lose as they return to their shell is emitted as light causing neon to glow. The wavelength of the light energy determines the color of the fluorescence. While all those brightly colored signs are commonly known as neon lights, it takes other gases individually and combined to achieve over 150 different colors. Neon produces a familiar reddish glow, while krypton glows a silvery white and xenon green-blue. Artists known as benders produce neon signs by bending lead glass tubes into various shapes. The tubes can be bent into shapes or into letters to form words. Once created, neon signs can last for decades. The beauty of light has lured man ever since he harnessed the power of electricity, but nothing catches the eye quite like neon. Did you know? Las Vegas has been associated with neon since the first glowing sign went up there in 1929. The city legalized gambling two years later. Advances in technology give us an ever-improving view of the world around us. Events that used to look ordinary appear extraordinary when seen in fast or slow motion. Element number 36 on the periodic table is krypton. The atomic symbol for krypton is Kr. Here, krypton gas is rotating in a discharge tube. It is colorless and odorless in its natural state, but it emits a silvery white light as it conducts electricity. The name krypton comes from the Greek kryptos, meaning hidden. Krypton lies in the periodic table's fourth row, period four. It is classified as a noble gas. Each atom of krypton consists of a cloud of electrons surrounding a compact nucleus that contains almost all of the atom's mass. In the most common form of krypton, its nucleus has 36 positively charged protons plus 48 uncharged neutrons. Krypton has 36 negatively charged electrons to balance its 36 protons. These electrons are found in four orbital shells surrounding the nucleus, which can be visualized as being built up from the nearest preceding noble gas, argon. Argon has 18 electrons distributed among three orbital shells. Krypton has 18 more electrons than argon. 
The first two electrons are found in the sphere-shaped 4s orbital shell. The next 10 electrons fill five clover-shaped 3d orbitals, and the final six electrons are distributed among three lobe-shaped 4p orbitals. A p shell can only hold six electrons, so Krypton's electrons fill the shell. This completely filled electron shell makes krypton, and the other noble gases, extremely unreactive with other elements. Here, low-pressure krypton is contained inside a discharge tube. 3,000 volts are applied to the two electrodes. Excited, the electrons in the gas emit a characteristic silvery white light as they fall to their ground state. Krypton is used for lighting for high-speed photography. Some fluorescent light bulbs are filled with a mixture of krypton and argon gases. Krypton also goes into luminous signs that glow with a greenish-yellow light. In 1960, the length of the meter was defined in terms of the orange-red spectral line of an isotope of krypton. Recently, a helium-neon laser replaced krypton as the standard. A wine glass crashing to the floor breaks into a million pieces. The rhythm of rainfall can be heard and seen. By removing the barriers of time, high-speed photography provides a glimpse into a hidden world. It's a world where common occurrences become extraordinary. The idea is simplicity itself. When recording, speeding up film causes images to slow way down. That's the basic principle of fast motion photography. But things often aren't as simple as they look. Step into a high-speed studio and enter a world of Hollywood high technology. A normal camcorder records images at a speed of 30 frames a second. In slow-motion photography, the idea is to expose the film at much higher speeds. Regularly we shoot it at over 10,000 frames a second. This is what one second's worth of film at 10,000 frames a second looks like, as opposed to real-time one frame a second. So it's very impressive, and we can shoot anything up to a quarter of a million frames a second, which would stop a bullet. In the past, only Superman could stop a speeding bullet. Now, any average Joe with the right camera can be Superman. The basic mechanism of any high-speed camera is, is a very, very powerful motor that rips the film through the camera at enormous speeds, anything up to three or 400 miles an hour. So you need an enormous amount of light in order to keep the exposure on the subject. The enormous light requirements of high-speed photography require anything but an average light source. Special lights using krypton are put to work. A krypton light source produces an exceptionally bright light. Together, several provide enough light for high-speed filming. Krypton's brightness and its extremely fast response to an electric current make it invaluable for quality high-speed photography. Film shot at high speed is played back at normal speed. This technique expands time and makes things appear to move much slower than in real life. The result is a breathtaking marriage of technology and art. We were recently working with somebody uh, shooting a Taekwondo black belt as he karate chopped through slates and wood and what we discovered was that there was an enormous shockwave that traveled up his arm as he came into contact. High-speed photography can make a scampering dog appear to run gracefully. It shows us that cats really do land on their feet when dropped from a low height. High-speed photography for people in commercials is a technique that enables everyday activities to gain a grace and a beauty that you wouldn't imagine. You've been given all the information. Now it's your turn to discuss the questions. Take a moment to talk about the following. 
What properties do the noble gases share? How do neon and the other noble gases produce light? If you'd like to learn more about what you've just seen, go online or check out these books at your local library. As you watch the second half of this program, keep these questions in mind. What are the most common elements in stars? What evidence supports the Big Bang Theory? The universe is a vast and complicated place, containing all the elements that make up matter. The elements and their properties help us understand more about our universe and ourselves. What are some common elements? There's oxygen in the air I breathe, um, nitrogen also in the air we breathe. There's uranium and plutonium in nuclear bombs or nuclear reactors. There's helium in balloons. There's calcium in bones. Nitrogen in the air, about 80%. Mercury in thermometers. There's carbon in diamonds, that's the strongest form of carbon. There's lithium in batteries. There's carbon in my pencil and paper. Where did we come from? Where are we going? Are there other worlds? What is outside the universe? What happened before the universe existed? What happens when the universe ends? These are some of the oldest questions asked by children and adults alike. Astronomers have found, calculated, or conjured up outlandish, appalling things. Whispers from space left over from the moment of creation, dark stars, dwarf stars, holes in the very fabric of space. Stars clumped in galaxies and galaxies clumped in larger, stranger structures. And it all is made of the same basic materials, hydrogen and helium, with a dash of neon, carbon, and all the other elements. How do we know anything about the universe? We have been trying to understand it for a long time. The awful majesty unveiled by night has stirred us to wonder and worship. Prehistoric astronomers used elaborate monuments to mark the sunrise and sunset. By 300 BC, Aristotle taught that transparent globes surrounded the Earth, on which were mounted the sun, moon, planets, and a sphere studded with little stars. As late as the 16th century, most people still believed the Earth was the center of the universe. Then in 1608, the Italian scientist Galileo heard about making a spyglass with two lenses in a tube. He built one and aimed it toward the sky. Galileo's telescope magnified things about as much as a pair of binoculars, but that was enough. He saw that Venus had phases like the moons, that the sun had spots, that the moon had mountains, and that Jupiter had four moons. Aristotle's perfect crystalline spheres were shattered, and the universe stopped being simple. And there were other strange things out there. In the middle of the sword in the constellation Orion is a star that would not focus to a bright point, no matter how powerful the telescope. The object came to be called a nebula, and over time, astronomers found many such fuzzy blotches in the sky. Staring into the sky also added to the knowledge about the Earth. While studying the outermost layer of the Sun during a total solar eclipse in 1868, the French astronomer Pierre-Jules César Janssen noticed an unusual yellow line in the Sun's spectrum. Sir Norman Lockyer, an English astronomer, realized that this line could not be produced by any element known at the time and he hypothesized that a new element on the sun was responsible for the mysterious yellow emission. Thus helium was discovered, the first of the noble gases. By 1924, Galileo's telescope was barely recognizable. New big astronomical telescopes had mirrors as well as lenses to concentrate the light. The one on Mount Wilson in Southern California 
had a collecting mirror eight feet across. Images were captured on photographic plates in slow, careful time exposures. In the dark chill of the observatory dome, Edwin Hubble was studying a distinctive kind of star called a Cepheid variable. Astronomers use it as a distance marker because they know how bright nearby Cepheids are. They know that the dimmer the Cepheid, the farther away it is. Hubble was looking for Cepheids in his photographs when he realized he was seeing Andromeda, an entirely separate galaxy two million light years away. A lot of those fuzzy nebulas turned out to be galaxies like our own, and the light from those galaxies looked redder than anyone expected it to be. It's just like the pitch of a car engine, you know, as a car goes zooming by, you hear the engine kind of go mm. With light, when something's coming toward you, the spectrum gets shifted toward the blue. When it's going away, it gets shifted toward the red. It was Hubble who recognized the significance of the red shift in the light. All those galaxies must be moving away from one another at terrific speeds. The entire universe was growing. The idea of an expanding universe surprised just about everyone and made a lot of scientists uneasy, even Einstein. Researchers wanted to believe in a universe that always was and always will be eternal. But galaxies flying away from each other meant that once long ago, they were clumped together. It meant something started them moving. The universe had a beginning. Today it is called the Big Bang Theory. First, the universe was a bright hot point, smaller than an atom. In the mother of all explosions, it started expanding. This initial explosion created the lightest elements, hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium. Eventually, the hydrogen gas in space cooled down and began to form stars and galaxies of stars, galaxies flying outward, surfing along on the expansion of space itself. So now we can calculate the age of the universe, it is the kind of mathematics you do on a road trip. If your speed is 30 miles an hour and you have traveled 60 miles, you can figure you have been traveling for two hours. The red shift tells us the speed of stars and the milestone Cepheid stars tell us how far they have traveled. When astronomers divide it out, it says the Big Bang happened 15 to 20 billion years ago. Well, we're answering one of the most fundamental questions uh, that human beings can pose, and that is, how old is the universe that we live in? How did it begin? And what's its evolution? Those are major questions. Those are major philosophical questions, uh, questions that religions have touched on, philosophy has touched on, physics is touching on, mathematics is touching on. Uh, and the people who are eventually going to come up with what is going to be accepted to be the right answer um, will make history of a kind. They will have contributed significantly to human knowledge. That, I think, is why it's, a, it's such an important set of questions. Today, stargazers usually head for the hills, Hawaii's Mauna Kea, the Chilean Andes, Arizona's Mount Hopkins, Robert Kirshner works 8,500 feet up, hunting dying stars. Kirshner watches for the sudden flare-up that means a star has exploded, a supernova, or its smaller cousin, a nova. The kinds of things I'm working on, these supernovae, which are events that come and go, if you don't get it this year or this month, uh, you know, that one is gone. You just lose the chance. A supernova suddenly outshines its entire galaxy for a few weeks. It is in supernovae that the heaviest elements such as xenon and uranium are formed, crunched into being by the sheer force of the explosion. These elements are flung far into space for billions of years before coming to rest in places such as the surface of our Earth. Yes, and we have liftoff, liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour. In 1990, NASA launched a space telescope and named it for Edwin Hubble. Unfortunately, its mirror was made wrong and its first pictures were blurred. Astronauts had to go up and repair it. Let's go fix this thing. We copy. Move it out of the sun a little bit. 
We had a good aliveness test. Outstanding. Houston Endeavor has a firm handshake with Mr. Hubble's telescope. We copy that, Kevin, and there are miles galore down here. It could be real exciting for the astronomical community, I guess, and for the whole world to see what Hubble really can do with uh, Good set of eyeballs. The out of focus pictures gave way to spectacular shots of interstellar dust clouds and the great galaxies of stars. In just one bit of sky, a tiny patch that could be blocked by a grain of sand held at arm's length, astronomers found 2,000 galaxies. They were seeing better than they ever could before. In 1994, at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Astronomer Wendy Friedman was using the newfound clarity of the Hubble to observe the heavens, and she stumbled into the cosmological controversy of the decade. Uh, our preliminary measurements indicate that the age of the universe is somewhere in the range from 8 to 12 billion years, and that immediately uh, brings about a conflict with other ages that have been measured. That is a problem. Her universe is younger than some stars, and the age dating of stars is very accurate. Scientists can read a star's chemical changes like a clock. When we look at a cluster of stars, hundreds or thousands, it doesn't really matter. What we have to do is go in and measure the brightness of the brightest star that's left in the cluster, uh, that's still burning hydrogen in its core. And that star is the minute hand on the clock, because that's the star that is closest to burning out its hydrogen, closest to ending its life, and that's a direct measure of the age of the cluster. But unfortunately, the star clock has been running six billion years longer than Friedman's universe. We're very close to having a kind of contradiction between the ages of the stars uh, and the age of the universe. This would be quite embarrassing, because you really shouldn't be older than your mother. Clearly, um, if the universe is 10 or 12 billion years old, then there can't be stars in the universe that are 15 or 17 billion years old. That's not logical, at least if the entire Big Bang theory is right or even close to being right. Wendy Friedman is well aware of the dilemma. She knows that like many other puzzles about the universe, this one will probably be around for a while. Scientists owe much of their understanding of the universe to radio static, a whisper from the sky. If you're listening to the universe with a radio telescope, it would mainly be a hissing sound. It sounds like steam escaping from radiators. They heard it first by accident. In 1965, researchers at Bell Telephone Laboratories built a powerful listening station to hear signals from the first of America's communication satellites. But they were distracted by an ultra-low frequency hiss from everywhere in the sky. What they were picking up was energy from the bright flash that started the universe, an echo of the Big Bang itself. Radio astronomy was, was the second big window we opened on the universe. The first big window was Galileo going and putting a telescope to his eyes and seeing what he could see with his own eyes and then with film eventually. The next big step was radio astronomy, it's a, great, a great step forward in terms of discovering new things and understanding new things. The discovery of the cosmic background radiation was a fatal blow to those who wanted to believe in an eternal universe. The Big Bang proponents had won. But the cosmic background radiation seemed to be smooth and even, coming from everywhere in the sky. Just what you would expect from a universe that began from a single point. But then why weren't the stars spread evenly through space? Galaxies should be moving steadily outward as the universe expands. Each should be moving away from all others like raisins in a rising loaf of bread. Astronomers had thought that the universe was sort of expanding uniformly and the galaxies were just going along and that the only motion we should see is the Earth going around the Sun and the Sun going around the galaxy. But in fact what we saw was that the largest motion of all was the galaxy itself moving. And that really surprised astronomers and, and uh, the only conclusion we could come to was that something was causing the galaxy to move away from just the simple expansion of the universe. And uh, after thinking about it for a while, that conclusion was 
that there must be a large group of galaxies near us. When astronomers plot the position of galaxies in their computers, they find filaments and clusters and walls of galaxies. How could that be if radio telescopes were saying the energy of the Big Bang was evenly spread across the sky? There had to be some seeds at the beginning. There had to be some small lumps in the early universe that are going to grow to create the structure. So Smoot went looking for irregularities in the background radiation to show that the Big Bang explosion was uneven. In 1989, his instrument package went up on a satellite, the Cosmic Background Explorer. It found subtle variations in the energy left over from the moment of creation. Announced in 1992, it was one of the momentous discoveries of the 20th century. The universe made sense again. Smoot later told the press these wrinkles in the cosmic background radiation were the largest structures ever seen and the oldest. The circular process of star creation and destruction began soon after the Big Bang and will continue long into the future. The star-forming regions of the universe are often hidden from view by dust clouds, but infrared astronomy allows us a way in. Now we can see clouds of frigid hydrogen gas condensing and starting to heat up the stars. When enough matter collects, Gravity is strong enough to squish hydrogen atoms into helium atoms. This fusion releases enough energy to turn on a star. A star typically fuses immense amounts of hydrogen into helium, releasing energy in the form of heat and light. But nothing lasts forever, and eventually the hydrogen will all be gone. When that happens, the star enters a second stage of life, fusing whatever material it has into heavier and heavier elements, as far up as iron. When the fuel is gone and the fires finally go out, gravity is free to collapse the star. A medium-sized star like our sun will burn steadily for 10 billion years. Then, in a kind of cosmic spasm, it will puff up to engulf the inner planets before collapsing into a white dwarf star. A star twice the mass of our sun would collapse even farther ending up as a super-dense star the size of New York City, a neutron star. A teaspoonful of stuff from a neutron star would weigh a hundred million tons. But what happens to a bigger star when its fires die down? Say a star 50 times the size of the sun. It may blow up as a supernova, leaving a neutron star, but then it keeps shrinking to infinity an infinitely small point with a gravity so powerful that not even light can escape. There is no there, there. It is a black hole. And the analogy that we have to space being stretched by the material is you have a rubber sheet and you put a ball on it and it causes a dent. Put a heavier ball, it'll cause a deeper dent. If you put a heavy enough ball, it'll just tear through the rubber sheet altogether. If you force too much matter into a limited amount of space, it'll just tear space like tearing the rubber sheet. You can be forgiven for thinking a black hole is some sort of weird science trick. An infinitely small invisible star defies common sense. It is what happens when you use mathematics as your lens on the universe. But out here on the high desert of New Mexico, astronomers found that black holes do exist outside of equations. 27 giant radio dish antennas, each 80 feet wide, are positioned over 13 miles to form a single huge radio telescope. They call this very large array of antennas the VLA, which stands for the Very Large Array of Antennas. James Moran is one of the world's foremost radio astronomers. This technique of radio interferometers was developed after World War II, but this is the first really big array. Dust obscures light rays, but this instrument can penetrate that dust because radio waves go right through the dust and we can see down to the you know, core of things that can't be seen in, in optical astronomy, for example. It turns out that a black hole can create radio signals as it sucks in matter. The signals can show up as a beam of microwaves, a microwave laser, or maser. Why you would find a maser in a black hole is a complete mystery. I don't think anybody would ever have predicted this. 
what we have found is that there's actually a very light molecular cloud in a disc shape. My friends refer to it as the Maser Frisbee. <laughs> We didn't go looking there, hoping to find something coming out of a very compact region around the black hole. It just uh, plopped onto our computer printouts. A black hole can attract dust and gas in its neighborhood into a whirling disk of molecules. Those molecules release great bursts of radio energy as they are drawn in. There seem to be black holes made not from single stars, but from whole clusters of stars. They have a mass a hundred million times that of our sun. But these monsters are still infinitely small points, capable of gobbling up other stars. But where does the stuff that falls into a black hole go? Does it just fall out of the universe? Possibly. Or it may pop up somewhere else in space, there may be white holes regurgitating matter sucked up by black holes in another part of the universe. A wormhole in the fabric of space and time, allowing you to go from one location to another without crossing the space in between. Or it might go to another universe entirely. Astronomy's reigning theoretical genius, Stephen Hawking, proposed that the black holes in our universe might well give birth to other universes. In fact, there may be any number of universes, like bubbles in the bath. We do not know, and probably cannot know. If you fell into a black hole, you would be stretched until you were thinner than a strand of spaghetti, which would not bother you because time would stop. The rules of the universe as we know them do not seem to apply to black holes. That is what happens when you start messing around with infinities. It leaves us with a universe with holes in it. A universe with a lot of room for imagination. The study of the universe can at times lead us in circles. The universe began and created hydrogen and helium, which in turn created massive stars that occasionally collapse into black holes that theoretically spawn whole new universes. And I think it's portrayed as if the field is in total confusion and, and chaos. And I think very often it appears that way at the forefront uh, when things are not understood and they're unsolved problems. But progress is being made. Modern astronomy is a young subject. And each time we get a new and better tool for looking into the void, we find surprises and more data that does not quite fit. So we are left with questions. We are part of the universe. The material that we know, the matter we are made of, started out as atoms produced by exploding stars. And that's why it's not an exaggeration to say that human beings are stardust, because the iron in our blood and our hemoglobin and the calcium in our bones and all the other heavy elements in our body were created in supernova explosions. So in our quest to understand the universe, we come back to ourselves. If we are made from the elements of stars, are we not then, in a way, the universe trying to understand itself? It is not quite what the ancients were talking about, but maybe we are in the center of the universe after all. You've been given all the information. Now it's your turn to discuss the questions. Take a moment to talk about the following. What are the most common elements in stars? What evidence supports the Big Bang Theory? We hope you've enjoyed this assignment discovery analysis of the noble gases. If you'd like to learn more about what you've just seen, go online or check out these books at your local library.